Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, folks. Michael Zuber, one rental at a time, back with his Thursday guest and friend of the channel, Mr. Jonathan Twomley. How are you doing, sir? I'm doing great today, Michael. How are you? I'm doing very well. So I thought maybe I would summarize for you what I took away from the Fed meeting yesterday, Mo most specifically Jerome Powell's Q&A after the release, uh, and then maybe talk about what do you think kind of the impacts or rolling impacts might be from here? Does that sound good? Yeah, absolutely. So basically, the Fed came out with their announcement. Um, obviously, they're going to keep rates where they are today, so not shocking there. Uh, they did double the taper, right? They now expect to be done by March instead of June. So they've shaved off three months uh, of that, so it'll be done in March. Uh, they did highlight for the first time, as I've been calling for for about a year now, uh, there will be interest rate rises in 2022. Not only will there be, but they're actually forecasting three. Mm -hmm. Right. The 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 median or average of of all of them is is three raises next year. And then lastly, the big one for me was uh, there will not there doesn't necessarily have to be a delay between the end of taper and the raising of rates. Uh, they're saying that the economy is very strong uh, and that that was in the Q&A because last time they ended the taper, there was a delay and then they raised rates. Uh, so now they're talking about, hey. We're going to end the taper first, but don't assume there has to be a meeting between when they raise rates. So I thought that was all pretty interesting stuff. Anything in that surprise you? Uh, no, to be honest, no. I'm not really surprised at any of this. I mean, you and I have been talking about inflation for a while, and we've talked for a while about how at some point the Fed is, if it doesn't abate by itself, mm -hmm. then the Fed is going to be, feel pressure to do something about it. Um, and I think, frankly, the economy, you know, it's we have sort of a double whammy right now. We've got these still supply chain, supply chain issues mm -hmm. and an economy that's running hot at the same time. Right. Yeah. So um, so that's kind of creating a lot of pressure. And I think that, uh, you know, the, the Fed has to respond. And I don't know if you saw this, mm -hmm. uh, but the Bank of England just raised rates today. They did Just today. Yeah. That's so a big deal. Yeah. So I think. Probably all of the central banks are talking to each other mm -hmm. and acting in, in concert. So yeah. uh, I think we'll probably see more of this uh, coming up. Yeah. So there's a lot of people out there, because again, I've been talking about rate increases next year that were like, they can't raise rates. They can't raise rates. I'm like, they, not only can they, they can, but they have to, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So and, uh, and I think, I think so. Like the, the, now the Fed tried to raise rates in 2018, mm -hmm. right? I mean, frankly, since, you know, it was always their, their desire when they went down to zero after the great financial crisis to get rates back up to a norm, you know, normal quote unquote level yeah. uh, over time. And they did what, what I thought made a lot of sense, which is just be very, say, this is what we're doing, right? right? And forecasting the whole thing and just applying this plan. The problem was that, you know, Wall Street, Wall Street which is addicted to cheap money, you know, scream bloody murder when interest rates went up to like, three percent or whatever it was on the fed treasury mm -hmm. right? and so and so the fed got spooked and they stopped which was absolutely the wrong thing for them yeah to do. agreed they should have continued to raise rates said the hell with wall street mm -hmm. you know you guys have to get off your we, we're giving you tough love you need to get off your addiction to mm -hmm. to cheap money right you need to stop borrowing money to do share buybacks and to stop borrowing money to finance unprofitable or you know, yeah. operations. <laughs> Let the right? dead companies go, right? Zombies yeah, exactly, go. Exactly. All the stuff that the Wall Street guys love to talk about for everyone else, right? Creative destruction and so on. Yeah, exactly. Never want to have it applied to them, right? Uh, you know, the uh, so the, the, the Fed stopped it. I think now inflation is creating a different pressure and maybe, mm -hmm. honestly, something that the Fed is welcoming sort of secretly mm -hmm. because it gives them a reason to ignore Wall Street and raise oh, interest sure. by to get them back up to uh, you know some kind of more normalized level, which I think is frankly healthier for the economy. It leads to less malinvestment, Agreed. Leads to less shenanigans. And it also gives the Fed some firepower if we ever do have a recession mm -hmm. for the business cycle again. So totally agree. I, I, think, I think that that raising rates is uh, you know, it, there's always winners and losers for everything. And some people's oxes are going to get gored. And probably my friends in the multifamily business will scream at me for saying 
anything about raising rates and thinking they probably want them to go negative. But I think it's bad for the economy to have mm-hmm. interest rates that are too low. Well, I did, that's where I wanted to go with this is because I get some of that on my channel. I'm not even really a huge multifamily guy, right? I, I actually took all my multifamily and found a non-QM lender that gave me 30-year money because yeah. I was afraid of what was coming. But yeah, there's 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 actually a, because uh, again, I'm an accredited investor. I'm on lots of lists. And the, the deals that have come across my, my purview, and we've talked about this, have been kind of repeating the residential mistakes of 06. Unrealistic expectations, bad, horrible debt structures, all short term, all IO, just kind of like rinse and repeat just with a bigger number. And now with rates going up, you know, at, at, I guess the question for you as, as this, when does cap rates start to feel it? Because right now we've been on a cap rate compression, but I, it feels like that's a spring that at some point it's got to pop up. No? It, yeah, it does. I mean, there, there are people who have differing views on this, but what there is, so there's not like a lockstep mm-hmm. relationship between the federal funds rate and cap rates but there is some kind of relationship right so and the reason for that is that as as interest rates go up the amount of money like you know per dollar of borrowing Mm -hmm. the amount of the number of cents that you have to give to the bank to to service that borrowing Mm -hmm. go up right yep makes sense and what the bank is looking for at all times is you being able to not just make your debt service by make it by, but you have to make it by a prescribed cushion. Correct. And is usually 1.25 X. Okay. So your earnings, your operational earnings, your NOI need to be 1.25 X greater than your debt service at a minimum, first of all, to buy the property, right. But then up even to operate it later on, but to mm-hmm. buy the property, there is, I've heard, well, I mean, I've heard some crazy stuff from some mm-hmm. lenders who are willing to go lower, but typically speaking, for like, say, your agency debt, your, your federal government-backed loans, which are the biggest piece of the whole puzzle, mm-hmm. right? That's the, the gold standard debt that everybody wants. Those, uh, that 1.25x debt coverage service, you know, debt service coverage ratio, that is going to grow, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right? So- what that means is one of two things. Either uh, the, well, it's, it's going to mean that the bank is going to give you less money, right? right? So it's only one thing. One of two things will happen as a result of that. Either people will start, first, they'll start as a retrade of deals. They'll start going back to the sellers and saying, I can't get the financing I want. Mm, yep. I want, you got to take some haircut, haircut on this yep. to get us under, to get us down to the, the, the LTV that I need, the loan to, to value ratio mm-hmm. that I need, or people are going to have to put in more capital, right? right. And going at a lower LTV. Yep. Uh, the, the first one, the first option preserves the return to the investors. The second option lowers the return to investors because you got to put up more capital, mm-hmm. right? There's only so much of the latter that can happen before investors start to scream. Now, right now, if people are concerned about inflation, it sort of depends on what, what portion of investor psychology is stronger at the moment, mm-hmm. right? So, and investors are always thinking about risks in some way, right? But it depends on what they're focused on, sort of what risk there is more worries. I, I, actually, about. I want to I challenge that a little bit. I think investors have one of two minds, either A, they're greedy and they think they can't miss, or they're thinking about risk, right? Okay. Well, I think yeah, it's a I, dichotomy. I agree with that too, but let's just follow okay. this for a minute and then we can talk about that. But, Fair enough. But what I mean is that uh, that you, you could be looking at the risk that is currently important to you uh-huh. could be the risk of losing money in the deal. Got it. People typically think about that like after a crash has happened. Right, right. Right. right? So like after a crash has happened, ironically, mm-hmm. When they're least likely to lose exactly. money, the crash has already happened. It's done, yeah. When they're most worried about losing money. And that's that when you funny. find it very, very difficult to get anybody to invest in stuff, even though the statistics show your returns are always going to be better. Your long-term returns are always going to be better after a crash because you have a reversion to the mean, right? After a crash, they go back towards the mean. When the market is hot, they revert down to the mean, right? right. So 
That's the thing that the risk they're worried about after a crash. Right now, what they're worried about is inflation, yes. right? Yes. Rightly or wrongly, they're that's what they're, the common investor is, because the press is all over inflation, so they're, they're freaking out about inflation, mm -hmm. right? And mm -hmm. so, they're, so that means that they may be willing to take that lower return, right? Mm -hmm. uh, to preserve- Right, preserving funding, capital, yep. Right? Yep. And so that means that, that a rise in interest rates may not necessarily lead to higher cap rates. Okay. However, okay, so that's sort of the general picture is that at the margins, it probably won't make a difference. Okay. One other thing is at play here, which is that the, your, the rate that you get from your lender mm -hmm. is made of two components. One is the rate at which they borrow from the central bank. Correct. And the second component is the spread that they make you pay, which is their profit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So those spreads can expand and contract. Correct. Right. So the, the banks may, it's a, it's a pretty competitive lending environment right now. The banks may eat some of that rate hike. In, for, for a little while. Right. For, yes. for a little while. So they may eat some of that rate hike. Uh, in terms of the spread. Mm -hmm. Now, where this gets interesting in terms of cap rates and everything else is, okay, if the Fed raises the funds rate by 25 basis points, I don't think it's really... Yep. If they do that three times this year, mm -hmm. right? And then they're also talking about next year in 2023. So we're already, well, actually, so the year after next officially, but you know, right. effectively next year, 2023, then you're talking about some movement on cap rates because the banks are not going to the banks are no they're not going to absorb most likely 75 basis points no there's no chance not not three quarters right. No. right so they're going to start pushing the rates up and then we're going to get into that that scenario of well you as the purchaser are you going to try to get a haircut from the seller well, well th it, th this is th this is the big issue that i see because again i've been in multifamily I actually own some multifamily and anytime you buy a dis distressed asset or a value add, the two things you have is a timeline, right? Mm -hmm. You need, if it's a smaller, you may need a year, 18 months. If it's a big one, you might need three years. And then you have a debt structure, which is some of the most toxic stuff I've seen in years that has to be reset or recast or whatever the right word is in two or three years. And oh, by the way, the Fed is telling you in the next two or three years, we're going to go up, you know, six times. Yeah. That is a horrible time horizon because your cap rate will be higher. They're not going to eat a point and a half. Yeah. And then the whole revaluation means, oh, sorry, LPs, either give me some money or we got to sell the building and you lose anyway. I mean, you do some of this math, it gets really scary. Yeah. I mean, so so that that's a whole other component to this, right? Which is, and that's more sort of less on the cap rate side of things and more on just the straight debt side mm -hmm. of things, right? But I mean, just to talk about this scenario. And by way of background, I mean, I've been talking to people for a couple of years now, just like you have, who had said, the, the, the Fed can't raise rates. Yes. <laughs> what? They won't raise rates. They can't raise rates. It will never happen in our lifetimes. The, it, it, they, if anything, they're just going to go down and they're going to go negative. No, so no. therefore, you should take variable rate mortgages on your multifamily because it's cheaper, mm -hmm. right? And you can buy a rate lock and all this kind of stuff and you can protect yourself and it's just better because rates are not going up. <laughs> now rates are going up. Yeah. And that, that means that those rate locks that people want to buy are going to get very expensive. Very expensive. Yes. And it also means that on refinance, like if you have not added a lot of value to your, to your property, you may have to go to your investors for more capital to make up the difference when you refinance. Yeah, this, now, all, this all blows up at the refi, right? It, it, yeah. People got fat, dumb, and lazy. They started trusting past reputations and past deals because the last 24 months, the Fed made everybody rich. It is going to be very uncomfortable in about two years when we have a point and a half or more rate increase, when people got to go refi and they go, either I get a check or I lose all my equity. It's going to be, it's going to be this, a sunk cost, write it off, or I got to send in more money. It's going to be I mean, tough. Unless one thing happens, which is that the rent increases continue to be as strong as they are, and you can grow your NOI. Enough. Maybe. I, I See, I, you're right. There is that hopium 
to, to steal a phrase from someone else. I think rate, I think value increases at least on the residential and on rent again, residential. So I won't speak to multifamily, not my area. I think we pulled forward all the value increase and all the rent increases uh, pretty much for the next five years. People are stretched. They just yeah. can't, right? Everything's more expensive. You know, to forecast 5% rent increases for the next couple of years is um, aggressive. Yeah. Oh, I would not forecast it for sure. Like I would never do but that. But could it happen? Sure. Yeah. I would never do that. But I mean, you know, we've had, what is it, like 17% across yeah. the board rent increases this year. Now, a lot of that is making up for the rent increases that didn't happen last year. True. Even some, rent, up. Yeah. some rent decreases, mm -hmm. right? So we've got, you know, uh, that's part of the reason for like the huge jump. Yeah, part of the but jump. I think, yeah. that, I think that rent increases are going to continue. We're, we're going to get strong rent growth, I think, continued for another couple of years, probably. Yeah. So, so I think a lot of people will still be okay. Mm. Uh, but, you know, but then there's this other dynamic that to the extent that rent increases continue, like the, the natural mindset of the market is to pay more for the asset because they're going to keep on forecasting those rent increases into the future. So yeah. you, never really, you can never really catch up with this. You know, some people get very lucky because they bought at the right time, but they didn't yeah. forecast those no. rent increases. Mm -hmm. The people who do forecast those rent increases are the ones who are likely to get in trouble because they're likely to overpay. You know, and it is happening. I've seen them. I get yeah. the numbers. Yeah. And the market, you know, frankly, has been ready for a reset for quite some time. Agreed. Um, but we haven't, yeah. you know, the, the, all the all the all the money sloshing around the system, those low interest rates. I mean, that, that's that's where that leads, right? I mean, this is why bad assumptions Wall Street yeah. and investors are addicted to to, to easy money mm -hmm. because it leads to easy profits. But at some point, you have to pay the piper, right? Yeah, so. it leads to it leads again back to that earlier comment: greed or risk. All the investors on the greed side, they want that easy money. They they did it last time; they want to do it again. They think past performance equals future performance. And, and they the also case. think that they're the ones who will get out. Like, yeah, that, they'll that be they, the one out the door. Yeah. yeah, they're the ones who will time it and be able to get out. Yeah, that's like, perfect. Um, yeah, I, there's actually a syndicator, a pretty well-known syndicator here recently that celebrated doing a deal at three and a half and mm -hmm. said out loud, he expects the cap rate to fall to 2.75. It's a class A property already. He, he thinks cap rates oh, are going you, down. You that's, that, he's predicting that for this asset. This asset he, just closed. And he thinks that they're going to sell it at a 2.75. That's what he said. For class A. Yeah. In, do you know where the market was? Or not Florida. Like Florida. Well, I mean, you know, time will tell, but. Well, I mean, if interest rates are, if the 10 years, two and a half, why the hell would you, I mean, again, at some point, this is a risk adjusted return. Well, yeah, obviously. I mean, that's, that is true. I mean, and, and that's the other thing about, you know, that I sort of left out of the conversation that, and this is why also Wall Street, I mean, the real reason why Wall Street hates rate rises is because they understand that money's going to go into bonds if bonds get to be a better a better deal, right? Yeah. So get two and a half on a ten year bond or two seven five on a risk on a frankly riskier asset. I'll take the two and a half bond, please. Yeah. So then there will be money that goes that way. Of course. Yeah. No. I, no, I mean, I'm agreeing with you. Yeah. Yeah. It's mean, like it's like a lot of money will go that way. <laughs> oh, so that, this, this is going to be sucks, fun. That sucks money. I mean, that sucks money out of. It's sort of like a. You know, if 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 it is two point seven five, then that means you know for the the you, know, you can get on a on a T bill. Yeah, like like that means that the cost of that the cap rate just went up because it has to. <laughs> it's not even a question. It's funny. Yeah, this is going to be very interesting. I've seen some really wild assumptions. I've never again. I think we shared this about ninety days ago. I'm seeing the same behavior today in multi larger multifamily that I saw in single family in 06. Horrible assumptions. It only goes to the moon. It never goes down. You can't. Get, you can't. You can't get hurt in multifamily. You want to bet, and then the the IO just short term debt is not good. Not good. So. Yeah. Well, it's 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 more leverage in a different form. Yeah, right? so, exactly. Uh, and listen, you know, there there people have erroneously stated that commercial real estate didn't take a bath in the last recession, <laughs> right? Yeah. And, and and multifamily took a big hit. It did, but, yeah. but it just did better than everything else. But yeah, that means the cleanest it, dirty it, shirt. It only lost thirty three percent of its value, yeah. right? Because everyone I, else did worse. But there were people, listen, who were doing the same thing in mm -hmm. multifamily. The difference between 
now and then is that in 2006, we did not have many podcasts. Mm -hmm. Bigger Pockets was a like a little fringe thing. Yep. There were like three people on it. Yep. Right? And they were all talking about flipping houses. Anyway. We were. Yeah, I was on one of the featured bloggers in 06. You could not. If you talk to the crowd funders, I remember going and talking to early crowd funders. Well, they didn't exist in 2000. They didn't exist. Yeah. At least I didn't. But know even in 2012, that. when they started popping up, I remember going to them and talking to them, and they were only raising debt. And I said, Would you guys raise equity? And they're like, We'll never raise equity. You can't raise equity. We'll never raise equity on this mm. stuff. And, and of course, that changed, right? Of so, course, yeah. every, so it would happen in multifamily, but it happened under the radar because multifamily investing was not available to retail investors. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was technically available to them, just nobody yeah. knew about it. Yeah, right? just, it wasn't front and center. Yeah. Whereas now it is, and that's also part of what has driven the, the, the crazy run up. Oh, it is, it is absolutely the last, it's just like single family home. The last year and a half of single family home was the masses coming in. The yeah. last year and a half in multifamily will be looked at is the masses coming in. And I know how this party ends and you're right, multifamily cracked. I bought a lot of single family homes in my market, it cracked first, but multifamily was about a year and a half behind. And I bought a lot of units, some zero down, uh, just to get it off the bank's balance sheet. So I look forward to doing that again. Jonathan, how can people find you? So a couple of ways. If you would like to invest with me, go to, uh, please Google Two Bridges Asset Management LLC, and you can fill out the form on the website and uh, we'll be in touch with you. Uh, and if you would like to join my free Facebook group with 12,000 of my closest friends, including, including Michael. Yes. Uh, you can uh, go on Facebook and search multifamily investment community. And uh, there's a couple of questions you need to answer, but uh, answer them and you'll be right in. Thanks, buddy. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Mm -hmm.